Hätte, hätte ich mein, mein Cappy aufsetzen sollen, oder? Das sind ja diese Vierenetzger Leute hier auf den billigen Plätzen. Deadline. Coming up now, the latest and greatest in Amiga 500 demo development, a seminar by Bartman of Abyss. You have the stage, give him a hand. Woo. Hello. Hi everyone, I'm Bartman and uh, maybe you remember me from such uh, seminars at the, as the Evoke 2019 uh, Amiga oops, Screen Safer Challenge. Uh, seminar. So essentially, we've been using C and C++ for Amiga uh, demo, intro, and game development since a few years now. And today, I show you the latest uh, improvements in our Visual Studio Code extension you can use to really get into the details of debugging and profiling your Amiga production. So this is the same sl uh, slide I showed two years ago. This was essentially the, the state back then. We have Visual Studio Code as an editor uh, are using a GCC uh, compiler to uh, generate uh, Amiga EXIF files run in WinUI and we have a, a GNU debugger uh, server and bridge so you can use single stepping, variable watching, breakpoints and whatever you expected from modern development systems. And since then, we released like three or four new games, and I continue to improve the extension. So, ta-da! This is the new one. Uh, essentially, we upgraded to GCC, latest GCC version 10.1. This gives another 10 to 20 percent performance improvement. Um, added a profiling feature, integration with Trinkler Cruncher, and that's like the big picture, and uh, maybe you saw the screenshot from the uh, deadline website. This is what, where, where you will be spending most of your time in the extension if you're profiling or debugging your production. And um, this is more like a teaser, so now we go into the details and I show you what you can use. So. This is the new features. We have uh, the latest GCC. You can use C++ 20 features. In our latest game, we are using advanced features like coroutines. Everything is supported even on the Amiga. That's no problem. The new uh, frame and DMA profiler. We have a graphics debugger for copper and blitter and all your bitmap resources. Uh, you can view the contents of all custom registers at every cycle in the frame you want. Um, 
you can profile your file size down to the last function or data. Uh, I did a shrinkler integration where you can shrinkle your productions directly from Visual Studio Code and get a profile view that tells you how much each function is compressed. So you can find the functions that don't compress well. Uh, we have debug overlays onto the screen, so you can draw rectangles, print text for debugging, and this is all doesn't disturb the performance of the Amiga. It's all done in the emulator. Also, I added uh, lots more models. In the last version, you only had the Amiga 500. Now you can configure the uh, emulator for uh, Amiga 1200, Amiga 4000, with FastMem, without FastMem, and compare the uh, different uh, CPU usage. Also, you can, if you, if you really want to know what code is generated by the compiler, you can go into the disassembly. It will automatically correlate the code with the source code. Uh, we have uh, 68,000 cycle timings uh, based on the data book and also uh, profiled from the game with all DMA latencies and whatnot. Also, we have now IntelliSense support if you want to use some assembly modules, although we don't encourage you to use assembly because it's, it's nice, but it's too, too much work to do. If you have an existing code, like we have a, a Doinux D-Packer in assembly, you can use it. We have now IntelliSense for that. Also, we have data breakpoints, watch points. So if you always wondered, so wh why is my program crashing? Just set a data breakpoint. That's something you couldn't do on a real amp. So this was like the overview. And the rest of the seminar is more like I show you how to use the features uh, and uh, in action. So let's go like that. And so. To start a new project, you open a new folder, let's uh, create a new one, Amiga Deadline, that sounds like a fun name. Yes, I trust myself. Then just, yeah, woohoo, barely. Then use, the, use just the Amiga init project command that's added by the extension, and you get a whole skeleton example, everything set up. So we hit a five to compile, and I don't know, my notebook is a bit slow and old. There we go. So watch the best intro you have ever seen in the last decade. Sound? No sound? Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, so this is just something to demonstrate. We have a copper, we have, this is the debug overlay. This is only done in the emulator. Uh, some blitter. Okay, now let's go and hit the profile button. Yes. So, here we are. This is the timeline. This is like the whole frame. Um, can watch in percent of frames easiest or many old school coders maybe want to use raster lines for measurement we have cycles microseconds whatever so okay the first line is probably the most important this is the DMA cycles this is every DMA cycle in the frame and they are color coded so you can uh, expand the tree back there and now we see, all right, so there's like 36% of all DMA time is used by just five bit plane displays. Then the CPU uses 25%, 19% for code, 6% for data. The blitter is using 22%. There's some audio and some copper. And you can now drill down into the, the time. So we can zoom in and we see, okay, there's a CPU code fetch, code fetch, data fetch, uh, data request writes to Blitcon. Line, color, everything's there. And then back there, oh yeah, that's the blitter. And 
Of course, you want to know what the blitter is doing. So, the next line is all your blitz that are occurring in the frame. Shows you the, the parameters and the preview. So you can see this, these are these uh, Abyss logos splitting around. So this is using like, uh, I don't know, si six raster lines. They're all here. Um, because this is the blue one is when the bitplane DMA is active and you're seeing something on screen. Um, that's these cycles. And yeah, of course you want to know what is my program doing. So we have here like a flame graph or call stack of your program. This is weight blit. Okay, with nothing. Oh yeah, this is, this is not no good code. It's doing a 30, 32 bit division on a 68,000. But uh, yeah, that's a, just an example. But you can drill down. Um, you can. So if you if you want to use see all your all your graphics and what's going on, have a few calls where you register your your resources so you can view them in the graphics debugger. So this is currently what the, what is generated from the copper list. The copper list is on the right side and. Yeah, okay, make it a bit bigger. Um, these, are, these are not the copper lists you create, but this is exactly what the copper is executing at each, each position. So if you design your copper list and uh, you hope that it works, but you don't know if it's executing at the same position you expect, um, you can check it here. Uh, of course, you can use the time slider to check what where the copper position is at the corresponding uh, display line and, and fixed position. And also, so if you, you can watch all your bitmaps, this is, this is the main screen. And now we can scrub through the frame and you see according to what is happening in this frame, where, how the blitz are occurring in like real time. So first we're uh, clearing, and then we're splitting all those. Um, there's like an additional features. You can do split rect, rect overlays. So you can see where are all my blitz. Uh, and the, the, the blit that is currently executing is like thick, thick outline. All there. You can watch your uh, overdraw. So you can check, oh, do I do blitz at the same position? Want to do this or not? Um, we also have uh, all the blitz in the frame in this list. So it's the same thing that's ordered by uh, position on the screen. Time-wise, you can scrub through and see in real time what's happening with all the blitz, source destinations, all the channels. Um, here on this side is all the custom registers that are valid on this location. So if we go like to the litter pointers and scroll a bit around, yeah, you see them changing as they do yeah, their bits. Yes. So, all right. So, Essentially, most of the features, you don't have to do anything in your code. The frame profiler just, uh, it gets the, the function names and all the call stack information directly. Generate the debug information from the compiler and the linker. So you can also go down if you want to check which function is using um, CPU time by opening up the tree view in the profiler. See uh, interrupt handler start, and then drill down. It shows you which functions are inlined, how much they use. This this is all done automatic. You don't have to do anything. If you have want to have the the names and the information for your bitmaps, uh, there's some calls like debug register bitmap. Just takes a name, size, number of planes, some flags. Can register palettes, so you can watch your uh, bitmaps with different palettes. You can register your copper list, and that just helps in the, the debugger to symbolize your name. So, and instead, the copper is executing here. 
the DMA request shows the name of the bit plane and it's not just a random address you allocated from the system memory. So that's nice. Um, we have another nice feature that's maybe not useful in this example, but if you do like, like games or demos, of course the, your, your CPU usage isn't the same every frame. It spikes around and maybe you have some frames where it's too slow and it's a bit hard to press the profile button at the exact frame that's too slow. So on the right we have profile multi that captures 50 frames and when it's done, doodle -doop. yes. This laptop is like eight years old. So yes. So you have thumbnails of all the fifty frames on top, with a bar graph of the CPU usage. This is one feature where you have to uh, annotate your code. Uh, I don't know. Ah, yes. You have, so it's, it's as simple as adding these two lines in your weight vertical blank routine. At the start, you do debug start idle. At the end, you do, do debug stop idle. And then the profiler knows how much, uh, how much CPU usage is in that frame. And then you can, maybe you already, not in this example, but in your, ex your case, you may see which frame has a spike on CPU. You just click on it, and you can debug and drill down. So where's, where's your problem? Uh, yes. So that, that's essentially I hope, the graphics debugger and frame profiler. Then the next feature we have the file size profiler. So just click on the on the L file that's uh, generated by the compiler, right, and go profile file size, and then go through your your executable, uh, and you can drill down which function or which bitmap is using how much space. Like uh, this is all the images that are in chip memory, like 50k, and we have all all. Functions, yeah, here there are functions. Main function is three kilobyte. Uh, who wants to volunteer to optimize? No, not now. Um, yeah, this is just to have your overview of your file size. Then you can go ahead. Your resulting exe file you want to want to pack it. Just go shrink a file. In a JSON file you can have some uh, presets. Uh, fast packing, slow packing, depending on how much time you have. Let's do some slow packing. It now starts shrinkler and when it's done, mm, I don't know if you have a time, yes. Should have selected the fast one. Okay, uh, I tested it uh, two days ago on my desktop PC. Yeah, okay, it worked. So this essentially looks very much similar to the size profiler, but now you get uh, the compression ratio for each function. Or, uh, bit yeah, you would if I wouldn't have forgot to don't strip out the debug info from the exe file. Oops, forgot. Too much iron bro already. So, let's try this again. Oh, stop the debugging. Yes, good enough. Thank you. Uh, shrinkle, yeah, let's do fast this time. All right, so, all right. We have uh, the ProTracker module, 60% compression ratio image. You get, you get the gist. Uh, Kprintf or 51 bytes. No, we can't use that. Uh, that's the, the shrinkler integration. Yes. Uh, I showed you the debug overlays. Uh, these are very easy to use. Uh, 
commands like debug clear to clear the, pro, uh, the overlay, filled reg, regged, text. This is like you would expect. And these are completely independent from the 68,000. These are at full resolution, not like low res or whatever. And we use them in games like to visualize the collision regged angles or uh, print out uh, the usage of several uh, items or functions. These are pretty useful. Um, then the different Amiga models, you can, we have in the demo project, you can just switch around. We have f Amiga 500, 1200, 4000. And um, if you want, there are some more models, but um, these are the, the main ones. Uh, I think you can, yes, in, in the launch JSON file, you just uh, uh, change them in the configuration. I think there's like some IntelliSense here, yes. So these are the models that are currently supported. Um, but of course, all the cycle counting uh, on turbo accelerators, not so important. Uh, all right, so graphics debugger, yes, yes. Okay, now I can show you the, the disassembly. We can go to the ELF file, go to... Oh, I, I, think, I, I think I forgot something. Now I even printed out the, my notes, but I have to read them. All right, let's do another profile quick. And I show you the, the assembly uh, profiler. So let's go to the assembly view. And you see, th this, is, this is your, your executable. Uh, all these uh, dark shaded lines that are not executed anyway. So let's go somewhere which is executed. You see there's like visualization of the, of the jumps. And we have, we have the assembly lines and then we have the, the T line shows the uh, CPU cycles according to the data sheet. And uh, that's probably not always accurate because you have the DMA cycles, maybe you have to wait on the blitter or the copper is executing or something. So these other columns show us that this instruction was called 16 times in this frame with an average of 42 cycles. And these are direct measurements from the emulator. This is not data sheet. This is numbers you can trust. Uh, so all the executions of this line is like 670 cycles. Of course, on the right side, you have the reference to your source file. Just click it and you know, ah, yes, is this line. Oh, maybe someone else could optimize it. Um, yes. and. A similar view do you get when you just click here on disassemble elf file. This is pretty much the same, but of course there's no profile information, so we have to rely on the data sheet cycles. Um, but the, the, the nice thing is you can just use your cursor, navigate around, and it automatically, on the right, right hand window, it jumps to the according source line. All the my cursor is on the blue line and all the gray lines, that's the same source line. So you can just go through, you get a, a nice highlight of the, of the branches and loops, and you can see, oh, these three assembly lines correspond to this Z line. So you can step through and see which assembly is generated for which uh, source code. Of course, you can do it the other way around as well. So click on, on, a, on a source line, and it automatically highlights, well, th this line isn't executed, so that's not good. Um, it automatically highlights the, the assembly um, code. So let's go maybe there. No, not good. Uh, wait, blit. That sounds like a good function. Uh, I'm lost. I'm lost, so, all right. Yeah. All right, so, 
It finds the references, and if the compiler has inlined your function multiple times, you can go through the results with these arrows, so you find every instance of generated code. And uh, this was really helpful for us. In a, uh, usually, hopefully, the compiler is good enough to generate nice assembly code from your C code, but sometimes if you have a tight loop, you want to see w what's going on, and this is really helpful when you see, wow, uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't look right, we have to do something else. You just hit recompile, uh, go to the disassembly again, and see does your cycles change. All right, so what do we have now? No. I talked about the, the assembly integration, so we ship with a d uh, default um, example. We ship like this uh, Doinax D-Packer that uh, we used quite uh, often when, when we ran out of chip mem and we need to d uh, store something compressed in the fast RAM and uh, unpack it on the fly to chip RAM. So I have to admit this is like the, the GNU assembler syntax, so it may be a bit unfamiliar for if you used to uh, ASM1 or whatever. But um, I did some, some IntelliSense support, so you can hit up, this is, oh, no, this is not, ah, no shortcuts on this one. Uh, what? Um, some... Ah, yes, okay. So you can use go to symbol and all the, all the labels are here for easy navigation. Uh, of course, you can go onto a symbol, hit F12 and... Nope, wrong key, it's too dark in here, so... Hit F12 and you can jump around. So that's, uh, that's what, what's supported, like uh, semantic highlighting uh, and definitions. Um, Okay, I have uh, the, the watch points, um, usually that's, I don't know if that's interesting, but I'll show you anyway. I think we have some st time left, yes. Um, hit F9 for a breakpoint, start, oh, I have to, uh, no, wrong key, that's once better. Yes, good enough, sorry. Ah, yeah. Okay. Let's uh, hit a, hit a breakpoint somewhere in the main loop. Yeah, that's fine. So, of course, you can now, all the variables you have up there, hit right mouse button and do, you have three, three watch point types, of course. Break on value read, break on value change, or break on value access. Uh, access meaning uh, read or write. So let's do that, hit F5, and will it work? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Apparently not. M M Murphy strikes again, but this is how you use it. Maybe it works for you, I hope. If not, uh, this is all open source on GitHub, so uh, open an issue, do a pull request, whatever. I'm always here to uh, continue developing. Um, all right, so that's that's like a walkthrough of the new features. Then now I can I, I, I can do a little better example, like a real world example. So maybe you uh, have seen we we did release a game called Wrong Way Driver. This is the only one I could get working because I don't have the current sources of the other ones. Um, I just start it up. Yes. Uh, no numpad. Uh, oops. Um, all right. Um, Okay, you can already see the, the debug overlay down there, or maybe it's a bit uh, small, let's do the big better. Yeah, so we have some statistics about our sprites. You can, of course, print anything you like. Now let's try if we can get, uh, where's the game ports? 
I don't know. What's this? I don't have a numpad. Yeah, use F1 for... Ah. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, this is not working. Okay. So this is um, not good. Um, so no in-game for you. <sighs> All right. But... Uh, oops, wrong key, yeah, next time don't bring an old laptop. <laughs> All right, so, okay, then maybe, <coughs> that's a bit unfortunate, I'm sorry about this. Let's do a profile, and then we can see a bit something that's going on. In a, in a more real-world example. So this is what it thinks it sees in the copper, but we have here all the resources allocated with previews on the right side, uh, all the sprites, the pre-calculated, um, the, the zoomed, pre-calculated zoom sprites, uh, score, I don't know. Oh, there's, there's a screen. I don't know, have it? Oh, we don't have any blitz in this frame. Yeah. But, okay, Th this is how it works. I'm sorry. Uh, move on to the next section. Oops. Um, yes. So, as I, as I said before, we have used these development tools now for like four or five productions. Um, so the title of this talk said something about demo development. Sorry, that's not completely accurate. We did mostly games the last few years. Um, but uh, as these games have also been developed using this uh, extension, I can tell you maybe a little bit about the, the implementation. Or you can have a look if you don't know them already. Do we have maybe some sound or not? No, okay, no sound. Who wants to sing along? All right, not bad. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we wanted to do a, a, an arcade, arcade quality conversion of Bubble Bobble to the Amiga, because if you're like some of my neighbors and, and ran the old version, you will probably be the be a bit disgusted that it only runs at 25 frames per second and misses half of the gameplay mechanics of the arcade original. So we, 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 we did a proper conversion and some, some technical details about this conversion is uh, instead of the original, which was like, I think it was a 100% identical port from the Atari ST using 16 colors running at 25 FPS. This one is uh, 32 colors, five planes and runs mostly at 50 FPS. I think yesterday we managed with two players and like 20 or 30 objects on screen to, to get it down to 25 but shouldn't usually happen. Uh, in this game, we, we tried a new approach uh, that, interestingly, uh, apparently not many people in the Amiga scene used. We did a blitter queue that's driven by the copper. So we don't have to wait for the blitter and uh, just have the copper initiate the, the blit, uh, wait for the blit in the copper list, and then process all the... Um, blitz in the frame. Um, this is nice because you don't waste any CPU cycles waiting for the blitter. On the other hand, you open another whole can of worms. That is, you have to make sure that all the blitz in the copper list are completed before the end of the frame because the copper will restart the copper list at the beginning of the next frame regardless if the blitter is finished or not, then uh, that's not good. Um, so we, we, we did like a little double buffering trick where 
uh, only the end of the copper list, when all the blitz are done, writes the pointer for the next frame's copper list into the copper register, and otherwise there's just like a dummy copper list that does nothing. Um, in the end, I think uh, we, we, we didn't use the, the copper blitter queue for the next project because it's um, quite a bit fragile and you have some additional CPU overhead because you have to write all the blitter registers to the copper list and then the copper writes it to, to the actual blitter. And on, 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 the, on the Amiga 500, you can't just count CPU cycles, you have to count the DMA cycles. And uh, the, the execution of the copper list to write the blitter registers, of course, also uses DMA cycles. So maybe in the end it didn't work out. We tried a lot of things. We think the performance for this game is very good, but uh, we didn't use it for, for the next games. Because also, now that the copper is busy all the time blitting and waiting for the blitter, you can't really use it for any copper effects anymore. Like, wait for a certain line, do some different scrolling, uh, change the colors, change the sprites, whatever. So, yeah. Worth a try, but uh, I don't think worth, worth the hassle, but now we know. Um, all right. Um, so the next game we did was, was an uh, arcade conversion of uh, Gradius or Nemesis, as it's called in different regions. Uh, interestingly, there wasn't an Amiga port at all. There's like ports for all different kind of systems, like I think there's, there's a C64 port, but no Amiga port. So on, on Tiny Bubble, it was like, um, uh, hold on one moment. Yeah, uh, with, with Tiny Bubble, it was like, um, uh, a lot of different people have already worked on reverse engineering and documenting all the gameplay mechanics. Uh, there was like a level editor available for Windows, so we could just use those level data, uh, uh, the, the, map, the uh, map graphics and the sprite graphics have already been ripped, so we just converted them to, to 32 colors for Amiga, and this uh, yeah, that was, wasn't, was, was a nice help. But for, for Nemesis or Gradius, so, there, there, there wasn't much around. There was like some partial sprite rips, but they had like wrong colors and not all the objects. So when, when Pink came to me and said, yeah, he wants to do Gradius because that's a great game and nobody did it on Amiga and maybe it's possible to do it right on Amiga. I told him, yeah, let's go ahead and do a bit of reverse engineering. So what, what I did is I reverse engineered the ROM, ripped out the maps, ripped out all the graphics. Uh, I did a custom sound music ripper, so we ripped out the original uh, music, which Pink then uh, converted into a pre-tracker module and uh, included in the game. Um, I reverse engineered all the behavior of the enemies, of the collision, of the level structure, triggers, and bosses. And first I, 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 I said to him, hey, well, the arcade is already running 68,000. Maybe we could just reuse the original uh, code and just replace the graphic and do like an like Amiga conversion layer on the graphics. But um, after we analyzed the game a bit more and noticed that it has serious slowdowns in not so crowded situations already. Um, so, and, and we knew they had a 10 megahertz, 68,000. So then he said, ah, no, that's probably not possible. Um, and um, then after, after reverse engineering the source code, I understood why, because it's not optimized very well at all. Like, um, they do collision of every object with every other one that's slow. The hardware supports like 150 sprites with scaling at once. So that's not good for Amiga. 
And essentially, it was like this. Pink called it the whole behavior of the enemies uh, by just analyzing the gameplay of the arcade. And when he told me, oh, I don't know how this works exactly, I look into the reverse engineered assembly code, tell him, yeah, that's like five pages of code. And he tells me, I, I don't know why that's so complicated. Uh, I could do the same thing in four lines of C code. And yes, he did. And so um, the, the Amiga code is much more optimized and Unfortunately, because it's like eight-way scrolling, and we have like, I think that's that's five bit planes at w as well, like like tiny bubble. Um, so, uh, if there's a bit much, ob uh, a little more object on screen, on the Amiga 500, it w it will slow down, but not nearly as much as the arcade. And if you have like an Amiga 1200, it should run at the full frame rate all the time. Um, yeah, because also the game, if you, let me jump to a section like here, uh, you'll notice maybe uh, the vertical scrolling is like a barrel around. You can infinitely scroll down and will just repeat the one from above, like you're scrolling on a cylinder. And of course on Amiga 500 is always, yeah, I can do that, but then all my, all my chip mems gone. We have to do it some, uh, some other way. And that, that was quite uh, a challenge, but I think um, it worked out quite fine. And uh, the Amiga version of the music, I think it's, it's even better than the original. Uh, the original only had some, I don't know, um, uh, it had two sound chips with uh, three channels each, uh, but they, didn't use all the six channels really and just duplicated some notes and uh, uh, it was really like some some weird compositions note wise but uh, I think having the original uh, song data helped with the conversion um, yes uh, I think that's that um, yes so in conclusion, I can just say you can now g get the, the latest version on the Visual Studio Code Marketplace. So you don't, don't even have to go to the website. Just open your Visual Studio Code, go to the extensions tab, type in Amiga Debug and try it out for yourself. Uh, if you don't want to code around, just have a look at the, at the uh, sample project that's included. There's, of course, we have no sound here, but there's like a pro tracker, like uh, the player 6.1 is included. So you can have uh, a nice play around and see how much easier it is to use C or C++ to code your productions than do it in assembly. I remember in the 90s, yeah, I, I liked the 68,000 assembler coding. It was the best, but it was like pink did some, some effect in Blitz Basic and I spent like a week optimizing it in assembly. So we all know we get more older and have less time for Amiga. So I think this is a really good uh, chance if you want to do a quick Amiga production, you can do it with, with very good performance and a uh, lot less work than doing manual assembly code. So go out and have a try and if you have any questions ask now or ask later i'll be around the bonfire or <laughs> or the barbecue or somewhere yes if you have any questions grab the microphone and ask now i don't see you but i maybe i hear you thank you Um, I, I was just wondering about the number of installs, just like 70,000 installs. When was it released? Uh, you're not the only one. Uh, I think it w I, I released it uh, after Evoke 2019. And I remember what it was like at uh, 50 installs. And I was at, wow, that's great. So many Amiga coders, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe this, this is just Chinese bots. I don't know. 
Yeah, because I mean, 20, 25,000 Amiga developers in the world. Mm. No, <laughs> it, it's more like 25. <laughs> So, um, how would you go about using this for uh, track-loaded stuff? Uh, cu currently, currently, this is all, uh, the, the tool chain only produces like uh, standard Amiga executables. Um, I think you would have to do a bit, bit more work, um, or contact me, and and I'll hel help uh, Im include some non-system executable um, stuff. So currently it's not really supported, but if there's demand, I, I can do it. So the whole development of this tool is largely driven by, by Pink wanting to do some Amiga productions and either telling me, hey, this doesn't work, can you do it? Or me uh, looking at him coding and, and uh, saying, wow, did this, this uh, looks like it's a lot of work. Let me see if I can whip something up that um, does this faster without you having to do so much work. So w currently we only did one file, executable productions, but uh, I don't uh, see why it couldn't be extended to, to do track loading as well. Um. Another thing, so the, um, you had this button to capture 50 frames. Mm -hmm. Is that configurable so you could capture 1,000 frames if you wanted to? Or? Um, currently, it's, it's hard-coded at 50. Uh, theoretically, you could do any number you want, but the problem is the resulting files are quite large, and all the profiler is running in... in uh, essentially, this is a browser application in JavaScript, and it's it's gonna struggle with the data at some point. So maybe you you hit a few times the 50 frame capture button, and you find your frame you want to uh, you want to profile. Yes. I'm really impressed that you got GCC 10 working with 68K. I, I read somewhere that 68K support has been dropped in GCC. Um, is this... It wasn't dropped. Okay. Yes. Uh, initially, it was planned to be dropped because they did like a rewrite of their condition code systems. But then, like, there was uh, a couple of, uh, I think, Amiga or Atari guys who collected some money together and, and paid someone to adapt the 68K backend to the new condition codes. And so now it's not, no longer in danger of being removed. Also, uh, I saw that there was, a, like, a team that did a 68K backend for Clang, for LLVM as well. So maybe that's becoming usable in the near future as an alternative. But uh, at the current time, I think GCC is very well suited for the task. Uh, the performance of the generated code improves by like 10 or 20% each, each version. So when we first started with the, the 6.2 version, uh, going to, to 7, it was like additional 20% performance. Going to 9, it was additional 10%. And going to 10, was additional 10%. So that works out fine. And uh, I'll try to keep my GCC modifications to a minimum. So the current GCC is like less than 10 lines of patching to get it working for this solution. So I think when the uh, 11 version is released, or maybe I missed it, I'm not sure, uh, I will of course update the extension to use always the latest compiler if, it, if it's working. Yes. Woo. Thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'm really impressed with what was presented. Uh, Thank you. But, but the questions I have, you said something all the new C, C++ features work, like coroutines and whatever. Yes. 
So what extent, like also the standard library has threading now and everything on Amigados? Um, well, the, the thing is this, yeah. Um, the, this is, this extension is, is, is mainly intended for like demo and game programming. So there isn't really standard library support. Yeah, that's it. So you, if you want to use fopen, no, you don't. You use like the open function from DOS library from the Amiga. This were, all the Amiga libraries work fine. You don't have a standard library. Um, I have included a little bit of the of the C++ STL uh, like type traits and uh, I think STD function to support coroutines, but th these are usually just just ri ripped directly from from the GCC repository. Uh, and you can use them if you want. So it's, it's a bit, of course, I, I, I don't do an Amiga port of the STL. That's like a nightmare to maintain, and nobody I know uses it. If anybody wants to do a pull request, OK, but I won't do it. But um, you, the compiler has all the features. So if you, I think, let's have a look if I have the, um, uh, no, I don't. I don't have the the coroutine example with me, but it's like uh, just one 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 page of code, and the coroutines work. Pinkies is using in his new game already the coroutines, and it, they work fine. Of course, you can customize the allocator to not use like malloc or free, but rather use like a like a pool allocator or pre-allocated uh, stack allocator. So that all works works fine. And uh, from the last version to the current version, all the profiling and uh, debugging tools all do C++ name demangling. So the C++ support just works. Yeah. No one? All right. Go hammer those Microsoft servers. Have a nice day and come to the barbecue and bonfire later for some fire action. Have a nice day. Thanks, Bartman, for this amazing seminar. Thank Give you for a... having me. And coming up in a few minutes. The old school music? Uh, yeah, old school music track. Track, The track. old school music competition, the tracked music competition, and the streaming music competition back to back.